If you will turn in your Bibles to the third chapter, the book of Philippians, as we continue our study through the word. Now, you remember that Paul is writing to the church that's located in Philippi. And it's important to remember that Paul's in prison when he's writing this chain between guards. And Timothy is scribing, writing the letter down as Paul is dictating this. And, and you remember that the first thing that Paul began ministering to the Philippians about was their concern for him. They were concerned that the great apostle was in prison. They were concerned uh, for the fact that if the emperor does not uh, give him clemency, that he could lose his life. And so they were very concerned. Paul wanted to let them know that Two things. Number one is that though he was in prison, the gospel's not imprisoned and and that it's not restricting his ministry, that that it's actually inciting the Christians there in Rome to be even more bold in their faith and to share uh, the gospel. But he also wanted to share with them and let them know that he felt that he was in a win-win situation. He felt that if the emperor let him go, that he would be able to continue to minister, continue to preach and reach more people and build them up. And that was a blessing. That was a win. If the emperor took his life, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And if God calls him home, then he's going to be in heaven. So that's going to be a win. So he wanted the Philippians to be at peace with regards to that. He began to minister to them about unity and how important unity in the body is. Last time, you remember, he was showing us how we can have unity in the body. God created each of us unique. You are the one and only you. There is nobody else like you. And God has created all of us different. He has given all of us different gifts and different talents and different personalities and different sense of humor and different bodies and different hair. And I mean, all we are all unique. And yet with all of this diversity, God at the same time wants there to be a unity. So how can we get to a unity with that much diversity? And Paul told us last time, it is unity in the mind of Christ. When we all put on the mind of Christ, once we receive Jesus Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, we became ambassadors for Christ. And so we are to represent now the kingdom and to represent Christ. So our personal opinions are set aside. We take on the mind of Christ and then we become a unified single voice in our culture, in our world world reflecting the voice and the mind of Christ. Paul talked last time about a couple things that will disrupt the unity of the body of Christ. And, and one of that is selfish ambition. When we are seeking not to represent God's kingdom, but to build our own kingdom, when we are trying to promote ourselves over Christ, then that's going to create disunity in the body of Christ. And then also if we are conceited, if we are puffed up, if we think more of ourselves than we ought to, then that also is going to create disunity. So Paul's desire is for the body of Christ now to be able to get along with one another. You remember as he told us to put on the mind of Christ, the humility of Christ, he showed us the model of Christ, that Christ humbled himself and then God exalted him. And so also is that the path for us. Christ humbled himself in the incarnation. Christ humbled himself in the crucifixion. But God exalted him in raising him from the dead. God exalted him in his ascension into heaven and is being seated at the right hand of the Father. And there is a future exaltation that is going to take place. And that will unite the entire world. That there is coming a single unifying event that will unite those people that have lived in the past, those people that are alive today, and all of the people that will be alive in the future. And that is that one day, 
every single knee is going to bow and every single tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And that will be a single unifying uh, event in this entire world. And so Paul looking forwards into that day that that is going to happen, that God has given the name of Jesus to be above all names. Now, you'll remember that he began to exhort the church there at Philippi to do everything without complaining and without disputing. So I trust we had an amazing week without any complaining going on and no disputes uh, in our lives as we received that exhortation from Paul and put it into practice uh, uh, this past week here. Uh, and then you remember that he talked to, to them briefly about Timothy and Epaphroditus and the change of plans. Now, originally when Epaphroditus brought the love gift to Paul there in prison, he was going to wait for the outcome of the trial and then bring news back to the church in Philippi as to how everything went. But you remember that Epaphrodites got sick almost unto death. Uh, and when the church at Philippi heard that Epaphrodites was sick, possibly could even die, they became very concerned for him. Well, Epaphrodites recovered his health, but he was in a hurry then to get back to the church at Philippi and minister to them because of their concern for his well-being. So Paul sent Epaphrodites, writes this letter, and then sends Epaphrodites back with it and lets them know that though Epaphrodites didn't wait for the outcome of the trial, what he's going to do is he's going to send Timothy, who's there with him, and he will come at the end of the trial and let them know the outcome of that trial. Now, as we move into this next chapter, into this third chapter here, we're going to see really uh, Paul's goal and his focus on Christ. Also, he is going to um, exhort them to beware of some dangers, and then he is going to exhort them to press forwards uh, uh, in their own lives. Uh, and finally, he's going to focus them on the fact that they have a citizenship that is in heaven. So let's jump into this third chapter in verse 1. And it says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So Paul tells us to rejoice in the Lord. See, sometimes... We can rejoice in the good things that are going on in our life. Sometimes we rejoice in the good things that are going on and the loved ones and the people that are around us. But even if there's nothing good going on in your life, and even if there's nothing good going on in any of the people that are around you's life, we still have a basis of rejoicing, and that is to rejoice in the Lord. Amen? And so he is telling us that we as God's children should be the most joyful people on the face of the earth because no matter what, we can rejoice in the fact that our sins are washed away, that we've been saved, that our hope is heaven, that we have the empowerment of the Holy Spirit operating and working inside of us, molding us and shaping us into the image and likeness of Christ. And we've got God's love flowing into our life and out of us. And if we've got nothing else, then that is enough right there for each and every one of us to be able to rejoice in. Now, Paul is going to warn them about some dangers. Uh, there were some Judaizers uh, now that uh, were out and they were creating havoc amongst uh, the church. And so Paul is going to warn them. Now he's already warned them in the past. And so this warning isn't going to be a new warning. And that's what he says. He says, for me to repeat myself and to warn you again, he says, it's not tedious for me. I don't get tired of that. But what's important is that it is important for your safety. As a parent, I really understand that heart. We live close to Green Valley Parkway, and Green Valley Parkway is a, is a busy, busy road. And sometimes my kids want to go you know, over to the rec center that's on the other side of Green Valley Parkway. And so they've got to cross over Green Valley Parkway. So whenever they want to do that, I always huddle them up and we're going to have a conversation about, okay, let's review how do we cross a really busy street to here. And, and so we go over these things. Now, for me, that's not tedious. 
It's not tedious for me every time to stop and to just go over this drill with them. Why? It's important for their safety. And so that's exactly what Paul is talking about here. He's saying, do you know what? That he's not talking about Green Valley Parkway in uh, Philippi. He's not worried about his kids crossing his street. But what he is worried about uh, is not a physical danger, but a theological danger. The, the Philippians there were subject to the Judaizers who were coming in. And what they were doing is they were teaching false doctrine. And Paul was very concerned that they would get their hooks into the believers there and drag them away from sound doctrine and drag them over into dangerous theology. And so Paul is concerned. He's saying it's, it, it's not tedious for me to review this with you uh, so that you can stand fast and that you can be safe. So in verse 2 he says, beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, and beware of the mutilation. Now, all three of those are descriptions of the Judaizers, the same, uh, the same group. Now, he calls them dogs, and that represents or denotes wild, vicious, homeless uh, dogs that would attack passerbyers. He, he calls them evil workers. And the reality is that while their intentions may have been good, what they did actually was evil by teaching them false doctrine. Now today, we really don't uh, deal with Judaizers very much, but Judaizers, what they believed was that Christianity was a sect of Judaism, that you had to keep all of the law. You could have Christ as your savior, but you still needed to keep your house kosher. You needed to keep all of the feasts. You needed to keep all of the law, all of that as a Christian, that Christianity was a subset of uh, Judaism. And what Paul was saying is absolutely not. That's the old covenant. This is a new covenant uh, and we are not underneath the law in any way, shape or form. And so the battle was uh, over the theology. Now, Today, we would say that the Judaizers of our day would be the cults. The cults are those who claim to be Christians, but they are teaching false doctrine. And so those would be the Judaizers. We would consider Mormons. We would consider the Jehovah's Witnesses. These would be a couple examples now of those who are calling themselves Christians and then teaching false doctrine. And so here we have the Judaizers, the same thing. So he calls them also the mutilation. Now the mutilation here is a reference to circumcision. The Jews believed, uh, the Judaizers were teaching that even though you were a Christian saved by Christ, you still had to have circumcision as a right. You were underneath the law and required to be circumcised. Now, remember that there were the Gentiles that were receiving Christ and coming into the church. And so the Judaizers were saying, you have to be circumcised once you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Now, let's go back to what circumcision is. Paul here is speaking sarcastically of the Judaizers requirement to, for believers uh, to become circumcised. So he calls it the mutilation. Circumcision was a sign that was given there by God through Moses uh, as a covenant sign of a child that is underneath the law. Now, what circumcision was intended for was a typology. It was now an outward manifestation of what is supposed to be an inward reality. It's just an outward manifestation of an inward reality. What it was meant for was to show that as a child of God, I am no longer underneath the control of my carnal flesh. And so I cut away the flesh to show that I now have spiritual authority and power over my life. I am no longer underneath the control of my flesh. So. The reality being that Christ is the fulfillment uh, of that. That is the sign of circumcision. But in the new covenant arrangement, we now have the Holy Spirit power that's inside of us that enables us to not be controlled by our flesh, to walk in the spirit and to live in the spirit. And so what was a typology under the old covenant has become a present reality through the power of the Holy Spirit. The mark of identification of being underneath the law is not necessary because we're 
We're not under the law. And second, we have the fulfillment in reality of what that was only a sign or a symbol of. And so Paul now refers to their demanding that a person be circumcised in order to be saved. He references that as uh, the mutilation. In verse 3, he makes his case. He says, for we are the circumcision. He says, as Christians, we are the fulfillment of what that whole typology was. He says, who worship God in the spirit. And we worship God in the spirit. Remember that Jesus said that he who is born of the flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the spirit is spirit. So it is the born again believer who has the born again spirit now who is able to worship In spirit, if you haven't been born of the spirit, then you can't worship in the spirit because you're not born of the spirit yet. So a child of God underneath the new covenant, we can worship God in the spirit. We can rejoice in Christ Jesus and we put no confidence in the flesh. Paul began to recognize and to understand that what he had been trying to do underneath the law was that he was trying to approach God in his own righteousness. He was trying to keep more of the law than anybody else uh, so that he would be accounted righteous by God and he would be allowed to come into heaven. We know that God allows the righteous into heaven, but who are the righteous? How righteous uh, does righteous have to be in order to get you into heaven? So here we see that Paul believed that God graded on a curve, that he was going to take the uh, the top portion of the most righteous, uh, and those are the ones that get to heaven. So Paul worked as hard for his salvation as anybody has ever worked, period. But the reality is uh, uh, that now, once he met Christ on the road to Damascus, he, he began to realize that him trying to achieve a righteousness that would be acceptable to God was futile. And what he did is he traded in the righteousness that he had been trying to work on in his life for the righteousness of Christ that was handed to him as a gift and freely. And he's going to compare that righteousness that he was trying to attain to compared to the righteousness that was given to him as a free gift. And so he goes on to say, verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. Confidence in the flesh means how much of the law did you keep when you were underneath the law? If you felt confident that you were really righteous because you were really working hard at keeping the law. He says there isn't a righteousness of the flesh, but of the righteousness of the flesh, I was working really hard at it. He says, verse 4, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day. Now the law required that all males would be circumcised. And you had to be circumcised on the eighth day. It's interesting that the Sabbath law said that you're not allowed to do any work. But if your circumcision needed to be done on the eighth day and that was a Sabbath day, they would still do the work of the circumcision on the Sabbath so that you would be circumcised on the eighth day. Paul says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. He says, I'm of the stock of Israel. Now you can be a Jew either by birth or you can be a proselyte. You could have been converted into the faith. Paul says, I wasn't converted into the faith. I was born an Israelite. And he says, and I was born of the tribe of Benjamin. He names the tribe now of the stock of the tribe of Benjamin. He says, a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Now, once again, there were the Jews who were living inside of Israel, God's covenant land, and there were Jews that were living outside. A Hebrew of Hebrews means that he was a Hebrew that lived inside of the territory that he was a Jew. The Jews that lived in Israel looked down on the Jews that were living outside. And so he says when it comes to being a Jew, circumcised the eighth day, tribe of Benjamin, I lived in the Holy Land. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. And and then he says, now let's talk about concerning the law. Now, when it came to the law, you had the moderates, you had the liberals, and then you had the conservatives who, who were keeping all of the law, the people who keep kosher. Uh, they're very conservative. And then you have the reformed even today. 
You have the Jews that, uh, that don't follow kosher, liberal, and then you have those that are keeping kosher homes and still living in corner law. They are the conservatives. So Paul says, with regards to keeping the law, he says, I was a Pharisee. The Pharisees were the strictest of all of the sects. They were the ones that were keeping the law more passionately than anybody else. Now, within the Pharisees, uh, there were those Pharisees that were liberal, moderate, <laughs> and very strict. So he says, I was the strictest of the sects, being a Pharisee. And then when it came for passion, when it came for zeal, how zealous was I as a Pharisee? He says, I was persecuting the church. I was so opposed uh, to the Christians who were not keeping the law that I was out there persecuting them. He says, there was no one who was more zealous, more passionate for the keeping of the law than I was. Concerning the, blame, the, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. And so... Here he is talking now about how hard he was working for his righteousness in order to be accepted and acceptable to God. He says in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, that righteousness that I had achieved by working that hard, he says, these I have counted loss for Christ. And yet indeed I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish. It was there on that Damascus road uh, as he was heading to Damascus to arrest more Christians that the risen Lord confronted him. And do you remember that Saul is blinded and he cries out, Lord, Lord, who are you? Jesus uh, said, I am Jesus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he reveals himself. And suddenly now, he discovers the righteousness of Christ that is given to him and replaces now the righteousness that he had been trying to achieve. Paul says, not only that, but, but, but I also surrendered my entire life. I gave up my entire life that had been bound up in trying to achieve this righteousness. Paul was an up-and-comer. He was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was a respected person within his community. He didn't just give up his righteousness. He gave up his standing in the community. He gave up his leadership position. He gave up everything that he had. And, and now he answers the unasked question, which is, how did that work out with you for you, Paul? Everything that you gave up for what you gained, uh, how was that exchange? And Paul says, let me explain it to you this way. He says, compared to what I have now in Christ, the standing that I had, the reputation that I had, the wealth that I had, the influence that I had, the righteousness that I was achieving uh, in my own works, he says, I count that all as trash <laughs> as rubbish and to compare to what I have now received in Christ Jesus to what my experience is now in Christ Jesus now he says that his life is just focused on that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law that's what he had been trying to do to gain his own righteousness by uh, obeying the law but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So here's what Paul traded. He traded an imperfect man-made righteousness for the perfect righteousness of Christ. And he says, this is trash. This is garbage compared to the perfect righteousness that I now have received from Christ. You have been washed and cleansed and forgiven of your sins. As a believer, as a Christian, he has robed you in his righteousness. And now we are not trying to earn or deserve our own righteousness. It has been given to us freely as a gift. That which we could never attain anyways. 
We could never attain the full righteousness. There's none righteous, no, not one. And none of us could ever achieve it, no matter how hard we worked in our life. But that which we couldn't ever achieve, God has given. What's impossible for man, righteousness before God, is possible with God. And God has now given it to us as a gift. Now in verse 10, he says that I may know him. That is now Paul's continuing goal in his life, that he would know Jesus. Now, that word for know, it doesn't mean an introduction no, like, uh, like I was introduced, uh, but it means to, to know them experientially. I remember when I was first introduced to Amber, when I first knew who Amber was. I knew her name. But I didn't know her experientially. I now, after all of these years of, of living with her as my wife, I know Amber. I know Amber in her good times and in her bad. I have laughed with Amber and rejoiced in victories, and I have wept bitterly with Amber as well. I have seen her in her good moods and her bad moods, her good days and her bad days. I, I know Amber now. This is I know her. And that's uh, what Paul is talking about. He's talking about living life with Christ now. To have Christ in the ups and to have Christ in the downs. To, to experience uh, life in all of its fullness with the power of the Holy Spirit in his life. He knew what living without Christ was like. And now he knew what living with Christ was like. And so now all he wants to do is just continue to live life knowing Christ. Living his life together with in Christ. He says uh, uh, that I may know him. That I might experience him in my life the power of the resurrection the same power the holy spirit power that resurrected christ from the dead is the same holy spirit power that we have indwelling in our hearts and in our lives and he is at work conforming you and changing you into the image and likeness of christ and and he is continuing to operate in your life and so paul now as he knows christ he knows the power of the resurrection now think about paul stating that he was doing miracles he was casting out demons he had authority over sick as an apostle he had incredible authority and power that had been given to him he was experiencing the power resurrection power in his life but being a Christian isn't just about the power of the Holy Spirit. It's also about the fellowship. Look at it, in the fellowship of his sufferings. Paul also suffered for the cause of Christ. And that is a reality for everybody that's going to know Christ. If you're going to know Christ, if you're going to do life with Christ, then here's what's happened. You have entered into a civil war that is taking place. When a nation is at civil war with itself, uh, then what happens is the minute that you align yourself with one side, you have taken on the enemy of the other side. You now have become an enemy because you've aligned yourself with this side. And there's no way around that. There is no way around that. The minute that you accepted Jesus Christ, you became a child of light. And the children of light are at war with the children of darkness here upon this earth. And the minute that you identified yourself as a child of light, you became an enemy of the children of darkness. And Jesus, he experienced that suffering. He came unto his own, his own received him not. A great light shone into the darkness. And they received him not because they loved their darkness. And so here we see that he ended up being rejected, despised, mocked, betrayed. He was scourged and crucified by the world. And he says that when we follow after him, the world is going to treat us the same way as the world treated him. And you will enter into the fellowship of Christ and of Christians and of the suffering that comes from the oppression from the world. And so we will experience the power of the resurrection in our life. 
And greater is he who's in us than he who's in the world. But we also now, we stepped into a civil war and we are going to experience the fellowship of sufferings uh, uh, from the children of darkness. And so, the power of the resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death. We are being conformed to the death of Christ. What does that mean? Conformed to his death. Well, what that means is we are being conformed into the death of his free will. You see, God gave each of us a free will. And then what do we do with our free will? We surrender it back to him. We crucify our flesh. And so, not our will, but your will be done. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not my will, but death to his free will as he lived, surrendered to the will of God. How are we being conformed into that? By surrendering our will to the will of God, we are being conformed into that death, the death of self. He says, if by any means, verse 11, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Many scholars believe that this really is Paul expressing the hope that the Lord would return uh, in his lifetime. Not a doubt that he was saved, but the hope that the, that the Lord's return and the resurrection from the dead was going to take place in his lifetime. Now, verse 12, Paul talks about his own sanctification. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. So Paul says, hey, you know what? I, I'm not finished. I'm not a finished work of God yet. I have not been perfected, he says, but I press on towards that ultimate conformity to Christ. In verse 13, Paul writes, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I haven't apprehended. He says, I'm not fully sanctified. He says, but there's one thing that I continue to do. I press forwards. He says, I continue to press forwards. And the only way that I can press forwards he says, is by forgetting what has been behind me. By not forgetting what is behind me, we can run into barriers that keep us from moving forwards. And I can think of two different barriers that can keep us from moving forwards. First is our accomplishments. Our achievements in Christ, uh, as we may have experienced a time when God was using us and, and, and he has done wonderful things and impacted other lives and, and, and other people. But sometimes after we have been used by God, we can stop being used by God. And, and we can look and say, I did all of that. And we can be satisfied with that. There are often times people will come up to me when they find out that, that, that I came out of Costa Mesa and sat underneath Chuck Smith and they'll tell me how they were there in the tent days and they'll tell me about you know the things that were going on and how they used to be in small groups and how they were leaders back then and doing different things. And then I'll ask them, and what are you doing today? And they'll be like, attending church. <laughs> and it'll be like, it'll be like, continue on, press on. Whatever God did back then, that's wonderful. But forget those things and continue to press on. God wants to continue using everyone. You're not finished yet, no matter how much you've done. Now, Paul, he's got a resume, doesn't he? I mean, apostle, look at the churches that he's founded, the new believers, God's all the work that he's done. If anybody could say, you know, I'm going to take a little break. Whew, I've done a lot for the kingdom. It would be Paul. But Paul says, you know what? I forget everything that I've done. That I forget the things that are behind. I'm pressing on to what's next and to what is before me and to continue to move forwards in my life. If you were being used in a greater capacity back in the day, 
than you are now, then I want to challenge you to be praying about that. God wants you to continue to be used by him. You are at your fullest when you are being used by Christ. And so forget the things that are behind and let's keep on pressing forward. So forgetting the past, one way that we can do that is we've been used in the past and kind of feel full in that capacity. The other way is if we feel disqualified discouragement and condemnation from our past is another way uh, that we need to forget that in order to move forwards in our life. Certainly many times people can say, you know, I, uh, man, I had my walk going good and all of these things. And then I stumbled and fell and I, you know, and I blew it. And now, you know, the Lord could never use me again. That's not true. His grace is sufficient. If there was ever anybody that felt like they had blown it, Paul would be a top candidate for that. Here was a man that was going around destroying Christian families, Christian marriages, and Christians. If there was a least likely candidate for someone who was going to be qualified to go build the kingdom of God, it would have been him with his background. And yet we see that he also pens in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no what? condemnation for those uh, who are in Christ Jesus. Let me tell you something. Yesterday is gone and yesterday is yesterday. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad and let's press on to what God has for us in the future. Amen? Okay, so Paul says we have to forget. Forget the things that you've accomplished and don't be satisfied with that and forget your failures. They are forgiven, forgotten, washed, and cleansed. And now let's keep on moving. He says, I forget those things that are behind. I press on to the upward high call. That is when we breathe our last and we are called now up into heaven for the prize that heaven of the upward high call come enter into the kingdom receive your reward and so paul goes on in verse 15 therefore let us as many as are mature have this mind and if in anything you think otherwise god will reveal even this to you nevertheless to the degree that we have already attained Let us walk by the same rule and let us be of the same mind. And so Paul says, if you're spiritually mature, you will receive the things that I'm saying. If you don't understand them or you disagree with them, God will work that out um, for you. He says, but nevertheless, to the degree that we're sanctified, let's walk together. Let's have the same mind in Christ. In verse 17, Paul says, brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern, for many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So Paul now is talking about those believers that are teaching false doctrine. And he's talking about those uh, who are taking and merchandising God's people for their own carnal gain. Today, if I was to look at this, and this example that I would cite where we deal with this is in the prosperity doctrine. Those that are seeking to tell people that God wants you to be rich and, and, and God wants you, this is the way that God wants you to be rich. God wants you to give me your money (laughs) and make me rich. uh, And then he is going to multiply back whatever you have given to me. So be really generous in giving to me so you can be really blessed. Uh, And that is such a misrepresentation of the word of God. And so we see that they are out there and they are seeking now their own lifestyles. They are seeking their own carnality. But here Paul says once again, to be careful of that, to test everything against the word of God. Is that the way that Christ walked? 
Is that the humility of Christ? Is that, is that the serving of others that we see Christ modeled and exemplified? And so know the scriptures and test everything against the scriptures so that you are not following after false doctrine. In verse 20, Paul points to the fact that for our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. He points out that our citizenship is truly in heaven. We might, might not be in heaven right now, but we're citizens of heaven now. To the people who were in Philippi, this struck a chord with them because one of the things that you need to know is that Philippi was a Roman colony. And what that meant is if you were born in Philippi, you were given Roman status. You were a citizen of Rome. So though you didn't live in Rome, you had the benefits and the blessings of being a Roman citizen. Now, Paul is saying, we're like that. We are here on earth, but we're citizens of heaven. And though we're not living in heaven right now, we still have the benefits and the blessings of being a citizen in heaven. He talks about the fact that we are, uh, right now we're in our lowly body, but then we are going to have glorified bodies. So can anybody relate with the fact that we've got lowly bodies uh, here? You know, But one day we are going to have the glorified uh, body, uh, and he is able to subdue all things to himself. He is able. Say that with me. He is able. God is able to subdue all things. Uh, under himself. As we close our study here, I want to draw our attention for a minute back to verse 8, back to where Paul writes, yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. We are introduced in our relationship with Jesus when we receive him as our Savior. We recognize that he died for my sins and uh, I am washed of my sins and I go to heaven now because uh, he is my savior. But what then is our relationship with our savior? In other words, if you're on the railroad tracks and someone pushes you off those tracks as a train comes by and he has saved your life, they saved you. But now what is your relationship with that person that saved your life? What is the ongoing working out of that relationship? And I find in people's lives that that relationship follows one of two different paths, either one of obligation or one of love. Obligation. He saved my life, so I'm indebted to him. I have to do now whatever it is that he wants in order to pay back that debt. And our relationship with Christ and our faith becomes an obligation-based relationship. Works is the currency of an obligation-based relationship. And when you don't achieve in an obligation-based relationship, then what you feel is guilt. You feel guilty. If you don't come to church on a Sunday and you're obligation-based uh, with God, then what you're going to feel is that God's mad at me. I didn't do what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to come to church, and I didn't, and so I feel guilty because God is going to be mad at me. That's obligation in a love-based relationship, uh, when you miss church, how should you feel? You should feel like, man, I missed out on encouragement and instruction, and I don't know how I'm going to last this whole next uh, uh, week out there in the trenches with, <laughs> without uh, being uh, encouraged in the fellowship of the body of Christ. And so it is a completely different feeling. It isn't one of of guilt. Uh, it, it's that I, I didn't get the sustenance and the nourishment to be able to, to keep on walking. And so we've got this love-based relationship and we've got obligation-based relationship. Now guilt is the emotion of obligation, but joy is the emotion of love. 
You see, in love, I am seeking to please the person that I love. I love my wife. And my desire is to see her happy. And so, you know, I give her a gift. And when I give her the gift, you know, I've been thinking about giving her the gift. And I go out and I buy the gift and I pick the perfect gift out. And, you know, and then I wrap it up and, and I bring it to her and I give her the gift. And when I give her that gift, then I see the love light in her eyes, uh, you know, as she looks and she smiles and she's happy. And, and, and now her happiness at my gift, that is the joy that is the strength of my life. When she is happy and joyful and I created that, I caused that in her, I feel like I can swim across the ocean or climb the tallest mountain. It becomes the strength of my life. I don't give her a gift because I hope she's not going to be mad at me and, and, and hope to maintain, you know, the no, certain number of gifts that a proper husband... How many gifts should a husband give a wife on a week? The average median gift is 2.3 a year, honey, and I've already spent 50% over what the average cost for a gift is here. So you better be happy with it because I did my part, uh, you know. And what I'm trying to do is absolve guilt of obligation in a relationship. But here's the reality. If someone gives you a gift out of obligation, do you even want that gift? Is that, get, well, it depends on what it is, but, you know, I mean, the, the, the normally, you know, the motivation behind the gift, uh, you know, is, uh, is that you wouldn't, uh, you don't even want it if it's not an expression of love. If it's not an expression of love. If it's anything else. And you see, that's what the scriptures are talking about when it says the joy of the Lord will be my strength. You see, we don't serve the Lord out of obligation. We serve it out of love as we've been connected to the one who loves you more than you will ever know, who sacrificed more than anybody's ever sacrificed for your benefit, for your welfare. And, and, and now as we're in this relationship with him, he says to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. When you love somebody, you start to get to know them. And so we start to get to know the Lord. We start to get to do life with the Lord. And, and, and as you start to do life with the Lord, then what you want to do is you want to please the Lord. And, and as you give him gifts, a gift of worship, a gift of prayer, a gift of time spent in fellowship with him, a gift of time spent in fellowship with, with the body, as you start to give him these things, then this is what happens. Listen to this. Then the Lord smiles at you. You made the Lord smile. And when you make the Lord smile, think about that. You made the Lord smile. <laughs> It's the strength of your life. There's nothing better. Then you want to make him smile again. And then you want to make him smile again. And you want to make him smile again. And the joy of the Lord is the strength of your life. It's the best part of your entire life is making the one that you love smile. And when you love the Lord, you want to make him smile. There's nothing better. That kiss on the forehead it says, hey, you did good. You're doing good. Keep at it. I love you, son. That's the greatest thing that there, that there is. The joy of the Lord that you cause the Lord, the joy that you cause the Lord is the strength of your life. Not the guilt of an obligation for the one who saved you. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you. And Lord, would you just continue to help us not be obligation-based <laughs> with you, but Lord, love-based, joy-based. And the joy of the Lord will be our strength. Bless us and help us in our relationship. Help us to be good husbands and good wives, not in obligation, but in love. And Lord, rekindle, re-fan the flame of love in our life if, 
if it is turned from love into obligation. The church of Ephesus, they needed to return back to their first love. They were doing a lot of works, but it was obligation now. Lord, if we're, any of our relationships have turned into obligation, would you resurrect them, Lord? Bring them back to life again. Fill our hearts, our homes, our lives, our church with love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, don't leave here without doing that. And if you need prayer, I want to invite you to come forward for prayer as well. Ladies, get signed up for your retreat. Continue to pursue the Lord. And so pursuing him, come to the retreat, get encouraged and, and built up. Men and women, jump into the Bible studies. Remember, we're going to draw closer to the Lord this year than ever before. So I want to continue to encourage you to jump into the Bible studies um, as well. Wednesday, we're in 2 Kings. Next weekend, we're finishing our study in Philippians. It's uh, the final chapter. So go ahead and, uh, and read forwards, and we'll see what the Lord has for us uh, this next uh, week. May God just richly bless you, and may you be filled to overflowing with his love. May the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. peace. Let's stand to close. I love you.